Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to the All Me Podcast. My name is Tavis Piatoli, sports dietitian from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, and today I'm going to be your host. There are more than 356,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests each year, with nearly 9% of them being fatal. When looking at sudden cardiac deaths in athletes, the incidence is 1 in 33,000 male athletes and 1 in 76,000 female athletes. While there are various signs and symptoms that someone can look for to help determine their level of risk, there are also lifestyle habits that may be increasing your risk. In this podcast, we speak with Dr. Ray Castle, owner of Action Medicine Consultants, who has spent the last 35 years as a licensed and certified athletic trainer about the significance of the emergency response protocol. Dr. Castle and I discuss signs and symptoms of sudden cardiac death, potential causes, the types of tests that can help identify if someone is at risk, the role of the athletic trainer on a medical staff, and the significance of the response time and odds of survival. Stay tuned till the end because Ray's going to share his story about the experience he had at the Boston Marathon during the bombing and how his team responded. Dr. Castle has an extensive background in education, clinical practice, and professional service spanning over 32 years. Dr. Castle's clinical background has included experiences at the high school, collegiate, and international where he was on the 1996 Atlantic Olympic Games, United States Olympic Committee Sports Medicine staff for the 2003 Pan American Games and 2004 U.S. Women's Bobsled. Also, he provided large-scale medical coverage and coordination, as well as has extensive experience in emergency medicine. He received his undergrad degree in kinesiology from LSU, where he began as an athletic training student. He also received his Master's of Science and his Doctor of Philosophy in Human Performance and recreation from the University of Southern Mississippi. He is a nationally registered emergency medical technician, as well as an EMS instructor through the Louisiana State Rural. Ray, thank you so much today for joining us at the All Me Podcast. It's great to to talk to you. I'm looking forward to this. Great. I'm so excited to be here. And uh, I have a topic I know you asked me to, to, we're going to talk about today. I'm really excited about for a number of reasons. So. Well, if there's anybody I know that has knows a lot about emergency re- response times and, and, and really tackling this topic, it's you. So uh, before we get into really today's topic, which we're going to talk about sudden cardiac death and emergency response times, let's let's learn a little bit about you from your career path and why you got into the field of athletic training. Well, that's that's that, you may have to make a, a novel of war and peace and how you know how to do that as well. So anyway, um, I was um, my path is somewhat the I think where a lot of colleagues of mine have been, they were they were injured in high school or had something for for me though. I was I was a uh, not so good in school and uh, bounced around a couple of majors at LSU and went from geology to ag business. I grew I'm from North Louisiana in a small town, St. Joseph. Grew up on a farm and uh, you know didn't do well in school and uh, took a semester off and came back and I really started to. I had to think about what I wanted to do from a career pathway. And I just started to ask those questions like, what do I, what do I like? And um, I've used that kind of as a cornerstone to what I've, uh, when I did work with students in the past and uh, basically said, I may be like athletics. So I've looked at kinesiology and um, I'm about a semester or so into it. And, and I'm having some classes with students that are athletic training students. And that sounded interesting. And, I'm like, I asked more questions about it, what it was, and and, no, and this, I'm taking exercise physiology class um, in the building, Huey P. Long. I know you're familiar with that building, and uh, so uh, having had your degree, do some degree work at LSU, and so uh, I uh, asked the questions, and one said, well, I can introduce you to Kathy Osborne, uh, who's the head women's athletic trainer. And I'm like, sure, I'll go talk, and, you know, by the first week or so of November of 1987, I set up a meeting with her, and... Uh, she uh, did an interview about 30 minutes and she's like, well, when can you start? And it kind of took me by surprise. I'm like, well, I guess I can start some today and uh, started that. And about a week later, I was working a job and had a look at finances and left that and started athletic training. And pretty much by the end of November of 87, less than a month, I figured I, this is what I want to do. 
and I uh, hadn't looked back since. So um, that's where I started and finished up in uh, 90 at LSU. And uh, so I've done a couple of different career pathways, you know, different things along the way and so on and so forth. So that's where I am and uh, where I am today. So 30 yeah. years later, having fun. I know you spent a lot of time with LSU and, and the academic side, and we're going to, I know you just retired from that, but you're still not retired. You're doing a lot and we're going to get into that, which I'm excited about. Now, let's talk about today's topic, right? Sudden cardiac death. So first of all, can you explain what it is? And is there a difference between this and let's say having a heart attack? Uh, Tavis, is that today, and I say I'm very passionate about this because today, five years ago, I'm sitting, well, this morning I go to work out, I'm doing yoga, yoga Lottie's class. And I'm at the last minute of class. We're laying down. You know, my arms are laid out. And I'm doing this, this relaxation. And I realized, gosh, dog, I forgot five years ago today I was I, I was having open heart surgery. So, uh, um, so you know, I'm there. And and today I'm giving a you know this this conversation about um, sudden cardiac arrest. I did not have a sudden cardiac arrest, but the, I mean the stuff we'll talk. I'm gonna hit on today, and you know, that it'll lead to is those things that are the signs and symptoms, things you look at, family history, uh, a lot of those things that get into it. So, um, so yeah, I'm a little bit passionate about it, you know, so um, just from different reasons, but um, having a family history and stuff like that. But anyway, to answer your question, I guess was, um, you know, we talk about sudden cardiac and what's the difference between a heart attack. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Well, I think the first thing you have to look at is not sudden cardiac death, but sudden cardiac arrest. And you're going to have that before you have, you know, you go into death. And so in the simplest terms, we have to look at it is when you have a heart attack and that's the, when you have, um, that is a blood flow issue. Uh, it's mechanical in nature. So, or the heart is partially blocked versus you have a sudden cardiac arrest. That's, that's a heart malfunction. And it's usually the, the heart will stop. Well, it will stop beating. Um, and it's, you know, think of heart attack as circulation more uh, than the electrical problem we see with sudden cardiac arrest, which ultimately, and both of those can lead to death if left untreated and uh, in timely treatment, uh, depending on, you know, what the severity is. But, you know, I kind of like to use tablets, I like to use the, um, you know, you look at this analogy of what um, I like to use it as like a, what, what, like a car, so to speak. And I'll talk about that. You know, you go to look at a shiny car, new car, it all looks good, but what's under the hood and how it's working. So you don't know it until that's running, but I'll talk about that. But that's what it is. That's the basic lack of that, where you have a heart attack, you have ischemia or lack of oxygen, which can cause brain damage in a very short period of time versus, you know, in the case you know, we've seen recent cases, we have a um, electrical issue. A number of things can occur with that. Yeah, and that's and that's something I know we're going to kind of dive into some of the, the root causes in, in Damar Hamlin's case, which we're going to kind of dive into. But let's talk about the root cause or the direct cause. Is there a direct cause for sudden cardiac arrest or could there be multiple factors that could play a role? Well, I think the, the key points is we're, you know, you got to think about two two classifications of of the of individuals. One, you have pediatrics, our pedi or the youth, youth like below the age of 18. And then you have our 17, 18, then you have the adult side uh, on up till, you know, through the lifespan. So from a pediatric standpoint, you know, the causes of sudden cardiac arrest or death, um, multiple, multiple things, but the big three that really stand out for pediatrics are, are going to be either they have a genetic issue. It's something they've inherited at birth or, the, you know, that, or it could be a structural issue. Like you may have an um, in uh, a mal uh, an arterial malformation, or you have so you hear that you know a number of cases children who may have to have um, surgery within a you know within a couple of days or a couple of months uh, for that, or uh, in the case where it may be in substance use and abuse, where we see that you know, and I know that's a you know that's something that's um, from you know Taylor Hooten Foundation is as well. That's a big, you know, it's a big issue in the youth with, with supplementation, with drinks, with illicit drug use, those things like that. And then you have adults, which are typically, you're going to see the big two, one of those being is, you know, um, um, heart coronary disease um, or, you know, like uh, blockages, uh, um, or you have something that's related to a heart issue that's not direct, wasn't there, but it's caused by another or, or comorbidity. So if someone's diabetic or they've had some other type of, uh, you know, uh, liver failure or something like that, 
or I mean, I'm sorry, a renal failure, the body will to, um, may have they may succumb to that due to uh, just an overload of the heart or something along those lines. Yeah, and I know you mentioned the youth. Sometimes there might be cardiomyopathy or enlarged heart and it goes undetected. And my next question kind of looks at statistics. And do we know like how many sudden cardiac arrests occur each year in sports, especially maybe on the youth side or even just in sports in general? Yeah, there's a, um, you know, I do this, I talk on this a good bit and with related to, you know, EAP re emergency action response and how uh, organizations are prepared and individuals are prepared to train. 2016 in a journal called Resuscitation, um, or that's it. And it, what you're, what they're finding, what the study looked at was looking at um, data from the uh, National Center for Catastrophic Sports Injury Research, the big database set that uh, a repository set up. So what they found that um, you know in high from high school athletics and the and college athletics. You had about in that in a period of like a four year period, I think from 14 to 18, there was uh, a 331 sudden cardiac arrest or deaths leading, you know, with that. So you had about, um, I think about 150, 560 survivors and about 170, 170 number um, with fatalities. So with that, the majority being, you know, you look at about, uh, you know, 15 to 16 percent are middle school, about 61, 62 percent are high school age athletes. And then you have that drop off at college and professional sports. Those two co collectively are about 16 percent, 17 percent um, of that total case. So that's kind of hope that answered your question uh, about that. But the average yeah. age is about 16.7, 16.8 years. If wow. I recall that study correctly. That's alarming. Yeah, I think that's alarming to know that such a something can happen so sudden to someone so young. And as a parent of a child, you know, I, I think about that and go, "All right, we're going to talk about testing in a second and really what to look for and how to how to make sure we can get our kids screened." When we look at Demar Hamlin's case, right, that got a lot of attention because it was it yeah. was live on Monday Night Football, and that really brought a lot of attention to something like this. And but was there a specific specific factor that you're aware of that led to his abrupt collapse? Not necessarily, you know, the, the, when, it, when that came out, you know, everybody was speculating uh, it's comodo cortis, it's comodo cortis. And there's not been, at least I have not seen this, there's been no medical professional that, said, that even you know, the NFL or anyone has said, hey, it is comodo cortis, that is the cause. They're not going to rule it out, but I think that's where it came into play. Um, I know that um, DeMar mentioned that in a, in a reference, but it's it, when I gathered, it was not directly. I'm not saying it is or is not. I'm not here to dispute that. Um, but there was an electrical. He had an electrical event. And that is, you know, it would be consistent. Probably, you know, he, he got injured. It was, a, you know, the contact, what the level of contact, whether it looks like that or not. But the other, you know, the confounding point goes back to that last statistic I gave you a little while ago was, you know, we look at all the number of athletes, that are, you know, in professional sports, college sports. And, you know, that's, you know, there's a small number. And as you get older, that number even decreases, you know, especially for the, for that population. So for him to be in that pop, you know, this is a very smaller and older population in his mid twenties to have that uh, physically healthy and the amount of, you know, it can happen to anyone. So. Yeah. I mean, when you, like you said, when you look at the impact of that hit, I've watched that hit a few times and it does make sense, but can you explain a little bit about what primordial cortis is? Like what's, what defines that? How would someone know what that is? Well, well, in the in the nutshell, the the prime age of that is in youth sports. That's the it can happen anywhere. So the you know that case, um, and I'm, I'm we're using hypothetically if it was if if that exactly was what um, Demar had or somebody else may have in that age group, you just don't see it very often versus in youth sports. So in the nutshell, you have you know you everyone's seen if you can visualize what the the heartbeat like an like an um, EKG does. You know the lines up and down the PQRS T wave, you know, so on and so forth, you see that. Well, what happens is that's showing the electrical activity of the heart and the pumping of the heart. So what happens is you have to have a blunt trauma to the chest, anterior or the front of the chest over in the heart region. And what happens is it causes, it has to occur at a specific part at the end range of, uh, in a, and even on this, a very, very small window, like a millisecond of a normal heart rate. So it has to occur at that time, but not only at that time, 
it has to occur. You think about the more and that when it does, it causes a disruption in electrical activity, which can result in instantaneous collapse and cardiac arrest. So what, what makes it um, more unique is that the more you think of the, the, it's one thing to get hit in the chest. Like if you and I, you know, we're in the hallway, you know, kids in the hallway, they get bumped in chest. That's one thing. But because an athlete is doing it during participation or persons doing it during participation, you have the heart rate increases. So if you increase the heart rate, you increase the number of times over a minute or a, you know, a time frame that there's an opportunity for this to occur. So that's what, you know, have that blunt trauma that hits the chest. It usually we saw a lot with baseball, softball, but it can occur in other blunt sports as well. You know, they're uh, lacrosse having a very hard object. Uh, it doesn't have to occur just in athletics. It can occur in other, you know, it could be in a mild, uh, a, major, a minor car accident where a child gets hit or the restraining belt. It could, it could result that, that blunt trauma to the uh, front of the chest. Excellent. Now, thanks for that explanation. That's something, something that we don't, like you said, you don't see it very often. It's incredibly rare. I remember in high school or when I, when I, the high school I went to had a fifth or 12th grade, but there was a kid running along the track and I, I wasn't at the school yet. I just remember seeing his picture and, you know, his uh, date of birth and his the day he died. But they mentioned that he was running around the track and he got hit in the chest with the jack with a uh, with a discus. And I was like, wow. So that maybe explained why he went into cardiac arrest <clears throat> at that time, many years ago in the 80s. But it's a pretty rare occurrence, it seems. Yeah. And I think the kicker, you know, part of that, Tavis, is the is that that you look at how you how you're responding to that. It can happen, but it's survivable. And um, I know uh, Dr. Dr. Jonathan Dresner at University of Washington does a tremendous amount of work in, in cardiac um, health and cardiac safety and things like that. Um, he's a cardio a sports um, is a specialist in cardiology. And you look at the number of cases that, you know, even um, in that similar study time frame I, get, I gave earlier, you look at that and looking at where the cases are, that it's, a, it's it overall survivability is about 48 percent at best. And, but when you use in even having trained medical personnel, uh, in that case, the study they did with that, they had about 132 cases they examined over a two year period. 90, you know, an athletic trainer would talk about that in a little bit, but an athletic trainer on site, 83% survived. However, with if you put AED in the place of that, then you're having it, it increases to 89%. So it's really, it's not 100%, but you have to have the tools and everything there. And it doesn't require, it just has, you know, lay response and things like that, that were really critical uh, for that case. Like you mentioned with that, you know, had it, had someone been there trained, I you don't know the circumstances of that, but you know, it really gets into the training and immediate response and being able to be, give somebody a chance to live. So we talked about, you know, we, some of the things with commodio cordis, but let's kind of go into the signs and symptoms. So are there any kind of signs and symptoms that someone, especially a young athlete can experience that, may indicate they're at risk for sudden cardiac arrest. If we know chest pain, you know, or shortness of breath for a heart attack, but anything that someone could look out for. Yeah, I think um, first off, you, you brought up a good one. You know, obviously unusual chest pain or their difficulty breathing is one uh, could be, and when, when in the absence of other things or they haven't been sick or something along those lines, um, as far as shortness of breath, we want to think about, are they having increased difficulty in doing the regular exercises, do they have a fatigue factor that's kicking in? And you're wondering, okay, why is that? Could it be, you know, obviously it could be, are they having malnutrition? They're not, you know, but over a period of time, they start getting this decrease in performance, which relatively unexplained, but these things are asked, they're saying the same thing over and over, you know, that comes up as a shortness of breath and otherwise they could really do it. So do, do well in that. Um, if they experience any lightheadedness or they may have said they blacked out, those are definitely, you know, something, if somebody says that, or they experience that, that's a definitely red flag that you need to stop. And I'll talk about that in a second, specifically about exertional associated collapse. But, um, if you have sleep apnea or snoring, that's something, especially at an early age, that's something worth uh, looking at that you have an increased risk of a cardiac event from there. Um, just general checking vital signs regularly. Those are, that's a, you know, if they're hypertensive, for example, um, think about what if they're having rapid and sudden weight gains or weight losses, that is that attributed to taking supplementation or other form, what else is going on? You know, I mentioned uh, about um, exertional associated collapse 
and then also sickle cell trait, someone having a, having a past history of that, they're, they're already going to be predisposed to exertional sickling. So um, they, they, you know, from uh, um, oxygenation. So it could precipitate them uh, causing a, a cardiac event. As far as exertional colla associated collapse, what that looks at is, you know, somebody's running. So I'll give the example of um, running across a finish line or running a, you know, a conditioning work. No one, and I, I guess I would ask you this, Tavis, have you ever seen anyone who intentionally fell down and stopped before the end of a, of a race? Yeah, no. No. Well, if they did, that's a problem. That's that's the red flag versus if they, if they cross over and then collapse, it's not good, but mostly it's probably going to be benign in nature, but we still have to evaluate them, you know, with that. So you think about where that looks of when that, but if they cross, if they collapse before the finish line, that's not a problem. And the one thing if they trip, but if they fall down and collapse and cannot get up or having difficult or staggering or other altered mental status signs, those are things, those will be the red flag, you know, some things to look at um, as far as um, those signs and symptoms for uh, young athletes and, and older athletes for that matter. Now, we talked a little bit about, you mentioned something about lifestyle earlier, and I kind of want to kind of dive into that because are there things, you know, with our lifestyle habits that you feel may accelerate someone's risk in experiencing an event like this? Like I see a lot of young kids pounding down energy drinks. You mentioned something about that, but I'm wondering if a high consumption of like caffeine or energy drinks combined with an intense training session could cause a sudden cardiac arrest. Yes, I think that, you know, one you look at, and it's just a simple, it's, it's the body and, you know, what you're consuming and physiology. You know, if you increase, uh, have a, a, a significant amount of caffeine or, or, or stimulant products, whether they're over, you know, it's, it's in a can and it's legal, you, you drink too much, you're going to, it's going to show up in vital signs. So, you know, you're already working at, like, for example, right now it's the summer, you you're taking a supplement, you're taking something that's already elevated the heart rate. And then you go out in that environment and then you are exposing yourself to exercise on top of that. It is, it is a fast way to precipitate having a cardiac event. So if they're going to have to, you know, getting a, you know, these different, I don't, I'm not going to say one particular drink because it's, it's, that would be, um, wouldn't be uh, do justice for that. But if you're taking a, a you know, a, a shot or something like that of a drink that has caffeine or something that's other, other, um, Nutri um, supplementation that can serve as a stimulant, then, or even eating certain things, it will, it can precipitate that. So it's really important that parents watch this, watch what they're doing. Eat, you know, if they're drinking 12 Mountain Dews a day, that, you know, or, I mean, I'm going to use that as an example, but Mountain Dew is good. I love Mountain Dew, but not, you know, taking, it has caffeine or some other, or Coke or, you know, whatever, anything that has Sprite or something, or even tea for that matter. I mean, you have to drink a lot or drink a lot of coffee you have to, or double shots of espresso or triple shots, whatever, then that's just something to be aware of. Just to, it's not necessarily one time is not the, not a, I wouldn't be that, that red flag, but if they're doing it habitually beforehand, that's something to think about, but also combined with what they're eating or more importantly, what they're not eating. And so if they're not eating and you're drink using something to supplement, that could be a, that's a, that could be a, a potential um, red flag for disaster. Yeah, I know. I, I have to limit caffeine because I'll get heart palpitations or even if you're dehydrated, like with the heat right now, the yeah. humidity, those are all things that people don't think about is like, if you go into a practice dehydrated, you had a lot of caffeine that could cause an electrical disturbance and rhythm malfunction. And maybe that's a problem too. That's I mean, that's a really excellent point that, you know, we think about being dehydrated. So, you know, normal, normal things that I would, we would tell, you know, and I know you do the same thing. Okay. If you're an athlete and, or, you're, or anyone for that matter, you're going out and you're exercising and you have a urine output. If it's dark yellow, it's, you're typically dehydrated. Or if it's clear, you know, that you're, you're, you are, are slightly yellowish, you're you hydrated, or you're having a normal um, uh, fluid level before you going into something, but you don't want to, it's not like drinking everything, but you hit, you hit the point right there. You, you, if you're dehydrated, which means your your heart rate and your other vital in blood pressure is going to be elevated, then you're already there before you even take a supplement or some type of supplement. And on top of that, now you added more, and then now you go exercise. Now it really pushes the envelope for a per, a, a athlete's health and safety. Now let's talk about prevention, right? That's an important thing. So are there any steps that we can take from like tests that could be done or screenings that we can reduce our chances of experiencing a sudden cardiac arrest? 
Well, the, the big thing is, is having a physical exam annually. That's, that's the one thing. It, and again, uh, you know, I'm going to use the, uh, I'm going to use the analogy of uh, that car that I, I mentioned. So, you know, you, if you have a car and you go look at the car and you, Hey, I want to go buy this car. Well, it looks good. Even, even a used car for example, you, you think, Hey, it looks good, but until you turn it on, it, you don't really don't know if it works or not. Right. So you think about that, but then what else, if you're going, if you ever had to buy a car, what's the one thing that you do after sitting in the car and you turn it on? What do you want to do? What do they ask you? Let's go out on the test drive. Let's test right. it out Get on the road. This is where the, where I'm not going to say the problem, but this is where the biggest, the, 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 where a lot of things are detected. So if you have a car, if you're having a cardiac or a family history of cardiac event, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but you have to really think about the person's history is if they have a history, you don't, it doesn't become recognizable until you stress it. And the one thing you don't want to do is be out in the middle for the first time of a long, you know, a, a big event without having, having a physical exam, without having any type of like, even having, um, you know, a 12 lead EKG. And we, even when you do that, that's not the full, that's, it sits there and it's still at rest. So um, if you go into your doctor, they put a 12 lead on, it's going to tell you whether you have no, having some obvious things right there, but until you actually run the engine, like, or, or as a graded exercise test, it tells you what the problem, what it's going to, it's going to expose itself in right. a controlled setting. So therefore you can treat that, but more than likely for electrical issues, it's going to be showing up already. Blockages are another thing altogether. It's usually don't show up until you have an exertion. So like for like, you know, in many cases, someone that's had a had to have a coronary artery bypass surgery, or they've had a blockage, they had to have a, you know, put a stent in or angioplasty. It's going to show up as, hey, I was doing something, I started having chest pain or angina. And right. that's where it, it precipitates into. So that's why it's a reason to do that. But definitely getting, you know, having a, and there's no set. So what's interesting is, there's no set age limit, you know, like if you go get a colonoscopy, they tell you, oh, you need to be at this age before you get, start getting colon testing or cancer testing, et cetera. But what you can do is look at, you know, you look at um, an easy thing to look at is really from a risk. Um, the, the American College of Sports Medicine has a risk stratification guidelines, and those are really helpful just from a, without just having a physical exam, it said, you know, what, what are some key things that would be the, 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 uh, the, concern flags that you may be having a, a potential risk or increased risk for cardiac event uh, that may occur. Now, an echo, echocardiogram, which is a, a test, like an ultrasound that looks at the structure and function of the heart. Is that something that you would recommend every kid get at a certain age, like before they start participating in an intense sport? Well, you know, it's not, it's interesting you ask that because it's not something that you're, if you can get it done, that's great. There are a lot of foundations and, th you know, that, that are, are groups that do that. If you can get it done, that's great. But the big thing is you want to look at getting a thorough history and sitting down. Like I mentioned, like the risk stratification for the ACSM guidelines. Normally it is, okay, there's a problem. And now we need to confirm what that, pro that, pro that problem may be with the echocardiogram or a coronary CT uh, or you're having other type of like a calcium test along those lines, other, you know, advanced types of testing or great exercise testing that's done, which is typically done. So, you know, for example, um, that ACSM guidelines and you're in one for athletes, it would be a 14 point uh, cardiac screening. Um, I'm, I want to say it's pretty much standard across the board now for high schools from their physical exam standpoint. I know for NCAA, you know, they, they, that's a required uh, component. They walk through that, that 14 point exam. But uh, when you look at things like, uh, you know, like the, I mentioned the ACSM um, risk stratification, you look at, you know, it's age, if you're older than 45 or older than 55, that's a, that just becomes a risk. And we know that because you're older, the big, the bigger things are looking at family history. So, and I harp on this all the time. If you have, if your first degree male relative, which would be your mother or you know, your mother or father, if your father had an infarct, uh, coronary, um, you know, issue or sudden death before age of 55 or for the mother before 65, that's a plus. That's a big, that's a big red flag uh, that you need to be thinking about that. So like, for example, 
a lot of people you hear, you know, having in their thirties and forties, then the, then the child or children need to, they should have, they need to be investigative, you know, which is also interesting because one question that doesn't come up is that, do you ever have a relative who had, who drowned? And if you did, what were the circumstances? And they, and when they do drownings, you don't, they don't do a, they don't do a, a had a cardiac arrest. It's, it's a drowning. So that's something to think about, you know, obviously uh, cigarette smoking with a sedentary lifestyle, are they obese? Uh, are, they, are they having dyslipidemia and are pre-diabetes or high, you know, and also think about high cholesterol. So those are things we look at as far as risk factors uh, in general, but you know, you want to think about the cardiac exam. It goes down the line. There's usually going to be a reason why you would want to get to answer your question is getting that. If you have the resources to do that, go ahead and have it done. So, um, but those are some, like the risk trafficking is easy. Um, and other history, like the 14 point exam for athletes really gets into the heart of, no pun intended, of <laughs> the core of uh, what, what, you know, what are some things that are showing up for that age group as well? Excellent. So let's shift over a little bit. You know, you did a great job of just kind of explaining what this stuff yep. is, risk stratification. But now we're going to move into the, the role of athletic training, right? With everything that cool. happened to Lamar, yep. it seems high schools are now taking a lot more interest, even though they have athletic trainers. But really understanding the importance of the athletic trainer, the emergency medicine professional, and having them on the sidelines in case these things happen on a regular basis. But how critical is it for a high school to have an athletic trainer on staff? And can you explain a little bit about their role? And job responsibilities. Well, I think it's you know here's the the critical point, and you know I'm I'm an athletic trainer and I'm licensed in an EMT, so you know when I look at this, it is it is more about having people that are trained in CPR and first aid and having an AED, having your emergency response plan or how to plan and how to activate it, and that has you know you look at there are about you know nationwide. You know, there's probably I think about thirty to I think around forty percent of schools have a full time athletic trainer. It's uh, twenty plus thousand schools, a little bit more, probably seventy percent or so have access. But it's about having somebody who's trained, and that's that's the really the kicker point is requiring coaches to be trained in first aid and really in CPR and AED use. That's the and anyone who's supervising that sport to have that. So that's the that's the um, the biggest thing, but far as, um, training, um, you know, the, the, what's unique about the training. And I did this for 20 something years as a program director and educating students to become that the one thing that as an athletic trainer, you're looking at an advanced practice or practitioner who understands who's there day in, day out, not only to be your, your, your emergency response coordinator, for athletic activities, but they're also trained in emergency medicine. They're trained in orthopedics and in, in, in primary care medicine, injury prevention. They're there to help prevent that injury that from occurring and making, helping keep track of that from a standpoint. So that's where, um, you know, it's two years of training at a master's degree level. Um, it's intensive core work. Uh, you have to sit for a national board exam. And then, uh, and that's the criteria to practice and license in states. Uh, so, and that's, and this is the foundational, the things we talk about emergency medicine, like, I, you know, I, I, know from, I can speak for what we did when I was program director at LSU, the first three months they're in their program, it was focused on emergency medicine. That's just, and that's just the start point of it. That's just to get them out before they even go into clinicals. So, um, you know, we're doing scenario based training and all those in, in, uh, high end training that we would, uh, move, move towards them. And they were trained to be in that time period, just to become similar qualifications as an EMT. And then we move them out into clinicals. So, um, and they could sit for the board exam to do that. That's just a three month time period. Now we got another, you know, really about another 24 months for, to train them to really see the full breadth of what they may see in any given uh, practice setting. Yeah. I think when people hear athletic trainer, they think this is a person that teaches an athlete how to run, lift weights, this is not a personal trainer. This is a sports medicine professional that is not a doctor, but they are trained to save lives. They're trained to treat athletes and they're trained to protect athletes. Well, I think you, I think the, we're under physician direction. And right. so we work with physicians where it's not just doing out on your own. We have, we, they, the one thing that the athletic trainer brings to the table is we're, by the time they get out of our program in two years, they're already taught that we're, we're teaching them to be 
in collaborative medicines, they're working with other providers. They work on developing that team, not only the team, but it also requires one thing we, we emphasize in emergency medicine you know, is have this pit crew approach. You can't do this all by yourself, but you have to have this pit crew that you see that just like you'd see in NASCAR or Formula One. If someone has emergency response, we we're responding to that as a pit crew because this you need more than one person to help save this person's life. And I, and I can say, you know, unfortunately, I've had to do that a lot over the years. Um, where I need more than one person, we bring, you know, just to do the things to give someone a chance to live. And that occurs in the first minute that goes on. It's calling that, you know, activating 911, having the right training and the right equipment there. And that's what the athlete trainer will bring in. They're bringing in a, a trained emergency response provider that um, helps to, it's an intermediary between when EMS is there, but also if they work with EMS and we work with EMS very closely when we are there. So it becomes, uh, in the case where you saw DeMar Hamlin, you see that they're already there. They already, they already knew how they, it was predictable. They knew this would happen sooner or later, just what every athlete trainer does across the country the, we know it's, it's predictable and they had a plan to manage that. And uh, that's what that really looks into, you know, you give an example of that. Now you have a license and you, know, you have a certification. What what do y'all have to do to maintain that and make sure you stay on top of that? Well, first, one of the requirements is uh, emergency cardiac care. So that's um, we have to have that maintained in addition to the training. So we our continuing education requirements are we have to maintain. It comes out to about twenty five hours every year going to continuing education courses. Wow. So it's one of the higher ones for some of the other professions. Um, we can only do it at certain. Certain providers, uh, we have approved providers uh, or um, that are approved by our board of certification, um, and they have very rigorous standards, just like they have for dietetics and other the same, same, they work in the same, you know, especially accreditors have different right. requirements, but we have that in person courses, et cetera. And then um, also uh, working under a physician, we, we can get, you know, at, you know, another example of getting credit under category A, um, um, AMA credit. For physicians, we we sit in a we, you know we get credit for those courses as well. So that's the other two accreditors we would look at. Now, what what are some of the steps that the National Athletic Trainers Association, maybe secondary schools, have taken, uh, or, or or are they taking steps to lobby to have more athletic trainers on staff? Well, I think you know the the one the lobby is a strong word. I think you I think we're constantly uh, pushing. We have we have you know at your risk is a great website the NATA has. Uh, for um, showing value, this, where the what what's needed is not necessarily value; it's necessity, and that is the core. You know, you can't put a price on life. It's the core necessity of having the uh, appropriate medical coverage. And um, I think you would hear other people say, "Look, if you're going to put sports on, you've got to have you need to have individuals there that need to be trained in a minimum of handling heart issues." Head, ish, head, head injuries, spine trauma, heat-related illnesses, and trunk, uh, we refer to as trunkal trauma. Um, those are the big five that, like, for example, the NFL, you know, uh, they, they, their training is those focal areas in. And the same, we do the same thing as well. So those are, um, you know, have that training. Um, those just really critical to have that. I think that's the big thing that they're pushing is um, also they do a lot of work with the NFL. Uh, NFL came out in March with the Smart Health Smart Heart Coalition, um, which now has, as of a couple weeks ago, I think 30 different major organizations are on board with this in terms of supporting the need to have more uh, athletic trainers at high schools. Um, there's And, and also part of that is changing the, um, changing the policies, l l uh, state policies in terms of uh, appropriate, what is appropriate uh, care and what should be done at those various levels, which we're seeing, a, a, you know, there's a big gap in that. Let's talk about response time, right? Because I know this is a, a big thing you mentioned earlier in regards to having certain access to certain things, but how critical is the response time? So when someone has a sudden cardiac arrest in sport, in life, you know, how, how critical is that in regards to saving that person's life? So uh, I'm going to go back to what I was talking about a little while ago, and, and I'll go. It, it leads right into that. So nationwide, and we look at policies at, at the state, 
high school association or the or legislative level. Um, and those are just dim, uh, policies related to student health and safety related to sudden cardiac arrest. There are 43 states, okay? 43 states have insufficient policies. And only 12 out of the state have the appropriate policies, having, you know, as far as coverage, having, uh, you know, having and requiring coaches to be trained in CPR, requiring schools to have an AED. Those are things like that, that in some, most of them have, you know, orange or red or it has some yellow. So there's a big deficit there in changing policy. So um, that's the first thing is making sure that, um, you know, having that appropriate, make, being appropriately trained. So response time, if you have people there who are trained already, that response time already goes down. So now you're, instead of waiting eight to 10 minutes or, you know, 15 minutes, depending on where you are, you're going to have a problem in terms of getting that response time for EMS to show there on site. So when we know that uh, statistically, if you apply an AED, on an individual in within the first two minutes of recognition, okay, there is a sevenfold survivability increase, sevenfold. Wow. Versus two to four minutes, it goes down to fourfold. And that is a, it's an alarming statistic that just going out and having, having e- equipment at schools, having the training, that's the base thing to give somebody, it may last for 15 minutes, but you're still giving someone a chance to live. So take, for example, Matthew Magnini. Matthew is a big lawsuit that was settled in Kentucky. Young, uh, like a 14, 15 year old uh, soccer player, summer conditioning. There was, and some of the stuff we talked about earlier, there was an athletic trainer and a coach on site. An AED was not used from what reports I've read. An AED was not used for 12 minutes till the um, ambulance arrived. Wow. So, Unfortunately, Pat succumbed to the, some to come to cardiac arrest. But those are things that we get into. Look, it's just this is trained personnel. This is it doesn't have to be a it's, you know there anybody's sus- suspect to it. Now, granted, you may have a bad, you may have a poor outcome. But the thing is, you have to give the patient a chance to live of this, and don't do something that could otherwise have have I hate to say this sealed the coffin, so to speak. So little things like, you know, when I cover, you know, I cover like right now, I cover NFL flag football league ages four to 14. And my first thought is, okay, I'm, I'm, I go right in. This is what the, the prime target age that we talked about at the very beginning of the present, you know, of this, of this podcast. But the first thing I do and I require my staff to do when I went cover my company, we're covering events is, and we do a system check part of a medical timeout beforehand, we turn on an AED make sure it's working every single time we're on an event and we document it. Okay. Did you do it? Yeah. I documented it. Yes. Do you doing a medical timeout with the referees and officials beforehand uh, to know what, and just walk through that two or three minutes to walk through that scenario. Are you doing X, Y, Z things? Those are things that are very deliberate. that don't take a lot of time that, that mean the world. In, in the case like we saw DeMar Hamlin, and this happens all over the place. It happens having a deliberate response. And if you have, you may not control all situations, but you can definitely determine that that delivery of care of what you're doing in the next couple of minutes when it does occur. Yeah, it sounds like you have to have a plan to have a plan, right? You have to plan ahead in case that worst case scenario does happen. Yeah, you do. And, if, and that's the one thing you can't, you know, we, we and that's, and, they would, and anybody in emergency medicine or any emergency response will tell you, you can't predict what's going to happen from one day to the next, much less that. But if you have a plan, then you, you know, you've already, you've already thought about it and you know, know what to do. It kicks in instinctively. Um, and then you're able to handle those things appropriately versus being just this uncontrolled chaos, so to speak, and not right. knowing what the outcome is. Now, for our listeners that don't have access to an athletic trainer or may not have the type of training of an athletic trainer, are there any simple tips that you can give them? Let's say they see somebody collapse in public and there's nothing around or something happens to a loved one, any, you know, from whether it's CPR, what would you recommend they do? Um, first thing just is, is make sure you're calling 911. Just get on the phone. But, I, I, you know, you hear cases of people, just the one of the biggest cases we see or episode or issues we see is that individuals just did not call 911. They're going to pick up their phone. They want a video instead. Like, no, they need help. So not assuming that is the case. And, uh, and the other thing is just taking a step forward and asking. It's not a lot just to ask, hey, are you okay? 
Um, you may not be trained in something, but that may be the difference. And, oh, I just need to help. I need help calling 911. It's just making a call. And that's where that's the first thing. But obviously doing uh, getting trained in, in uh, CPR and AED, it's relatively easy. It's inexpensive. And that's the that's and doing first aid and bleeding control. Those are the big things like stop the bleed, et cetera. Um, those are things that we, you can do easy training and they're, they're easy just for the lay person to do the training to that will easily, um, you can get that training relatively inexpensively or, or, or anywhere for that matter that's uh, available. Right. Yeah. My daughter's starting, she's 12, but she's a, she's like five, nine almost as a 12 year old. She's starting to babysit. And I'm like, you have to get this training. You have to get CPR certified, et cetera, et cetera, because you just have to prepare for those type of events, even though you, you know, you hope those things don't happen. And it might not be sudden cardiac arrest. It could be choking. It could be anything related that they just need to get immediate attention. So, you know, this is what's in you know, you bring this point. So I've been practicing for including my time as a, as an athletic training student practicing almost uh, 35 years now, give or take. And I have, I've come close to doing CPR, but I've never had to do CPR. Um, you take, you know, at the case of um, the athletic training staff for the Buffalo Bills in talking, I know, and Denny has mentioned this, he became, you know, focal point. He was not the only one there, but he just, you know, there, Denny um, Kensington, Ken, uh, Kellington, I'm sorry. Um, he had, he'd never done CPR until that day. So you go in front of millions of people doing CPR along with the other staff. That's a big, you know, it's a big deal. Um, and a lot, and a lot of healthcare providers have never done CPR and we hope we don't ever have to, but you train for that time to do that. So it kicks in instinctively and it's not just doing, getting in front of a mannequin. I think that one of the biggest mistakes I think that we, that, uh, that, that, um, I have seen and, and I, like I did this early on, it's like, Oh, I'm going to get in front of a mannequin do CPR. That just shows me, I know how to do the compressions. How do you need, you have to do scenario based training and these mini scenarios that really work into situations that really expose weaknesses when you, like for, especially for athletic settings, you have these deliberate scenarios, just like you run plays in a game. And uh, that's, re- it's super important to do that. I mean, I, I did that myself once um, I was doing actually when I was doing my EMT surf, it kind of a side story with this is I was doing, we had to do, start doing scenario training once we went through the EMT training or they st- some of the classroom and lab work. And the, what was, what was funny about this, but it really helped me to understand where I need to move in terms of that comfort, like being comfortable, being uncomfortable is, um, is, I went into the scenario in the room and two of my classmates, they were running the scenario already. And I looked at the instructor who I kn- had known for a long time and he, I'd worked with him on some other projects and stuff. And I said, I got to stop for a second. And he's like, what's going on? And he's like, um, I'm kind of frozen. I don't know what to do. And he's like, what? He's like, look, I've been in the field for 20, you know, 25, 30 plus years. And I don't know, I've always been the first person there. And now you're asking me to do something where I have three, or two or three people already there. And I just never had encountered that as a, as, as a training scenario. And I laugh about it, but it's also it, it, at that point in time, I, it really fueled me to really get better as a provider is where a little, th- you know, is being not just being the being a third person, putting an unusual situation. That's where scenario training comes into play that um, is really uh, beneficial. I just thought I'd share that just to, and I think you see that a lot. We see that a lot of being comfortable, being uncomfortable in training, which really gets you better to prepare for all types of situations. Excellent. Now let's talk about your company, Action Medicine Consultants and the work you do with emergency medicine. Tell us a little bit about what Action Medicine Consultants is as as a company. Well, I started the company in March of 2012, and it was more of um, trying to start doing event coverage. I was getting called a lot when I was working at LSU to cover uh, events or they need coverage for events. So um, I started that. I now um, provide, the company provides medical coordination for 30 plus large scale events uh, across the Southern U.S., uh, I do, uh, we do emergency response training, working with prov- going into institutions and doing large scale scenario based training, work on um, their emergency action plan audits. We work on obviously general education, uh, CPR, first aid certification. And uh, that's really the, and do some other consulting work. But that's what I've evolved, it's evolved to over the last 10, 10, 11 years now. So, didn't your team cover the Boston Marathon during the bombings? 
I, I think I remember seeing something yeah. about that. Yeah, so. we did. As a matter of fact, yeah, it's a uh, talk about a, a point of being prepared for anything. So, um, so this is when I was at, L in, um, when I was at LSU um, in 13. That was my first year to go up there. I know the medical coordinator, Chris Toronos, and other colleagues, and they always asked me coming up, hey, come up, work the event, It'd be a great event, bring your students. So I brought three student, students or athletic training students up um, to volunteer. It's a phenomenal experience. We have just a fantastic time. I, that's one of the, one of the, just an awesome event to go to. And I say anybody, if you want to go see a great event, just go to, you know, Patriots Day in Boston in April. It's worth the trip just to go. It's just a, the vibe is there. It's so great. But anyway, yes, we were, um, I was working finish line and uh, doing medical coverage. And we had several students along the, uh, one was there doing wheelchair responsibility. Another one, other two were back about 150 yards um, providing secondary care uh, that day. So, um, you know, just you move forward, you're not expecting, and it's just, you're trained to unexpected. So we ran forward and um, people asked, well, where were you? I'm like, well, just really too close, you know, and being about 30, probably 30, 40 yards from bomb site one, of the bomb wow. blast. And uh, so um, those athlete trainers, when you look at that video, you'll see uh, with a white jacket and a red hat. And um, I happen to be, just, you know, where I was and being one of the first ones that response side. And, you know, you walk into a war zone, not what you're expecting, but, you know, instincts, in, instincts kick over at that point in time. I mean, it's just overwhelming to, uh, and, and that's what a lot of training goes into is you, you have to train to be instinctively in that mode to do those things. I was never, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I was trained to do that. No, no one was trained to see that type of that mass, you know, the mass casually that day, but we work collectively, everybody, you know, People swarmed in, uh, emergency response, everybody. And we're all working together side by side and not having to say, hey, who are you or who are you? We know what to do in that situation. That's where, you know, I think my training as an athletic trainer, having run forward a lot and doing those things and working with providers helped out tremendously, at least for me personally, I should say, uh, in being able to uh, handle that situation. Excellent. No, really appreciate it. Glad you were there and not, you know, not to be attacked, but glad you were there to be able to respond to that and Definitely, it's something unique that you hopefully will never see again. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, what does the future look like for Action Medicine Consultants? What's your plans moving forward with the company? Well, right now, um, just I'm expanding event coverage, um, uh, bringing on more uh, PRN staff. I've got some more new events coming up this next year. Um, really, the, the big thing I try to work a lot on, Tavis, is just really focusing on my processes that I do. At events and just trying to gradually evaluate every time where after we do an event and before event, making sure if there's anything, basically, you know, it's like a you're doing your post-event timeout as a review. What did we do well? What could I what could have been done better um, in managing different types of situations? That's the first thing I'm doing right now. Um, the other side is really just I'm, I'm looking at some other um, service lines. We're doing more doing more work in terms of emergency response training and um, the, like, for example, or organizations really developing the process uh, or working with organizations to um, do audits on their review. So they have, an, um, have a comprehensive plan, but they need somebody to come in to look at that. And let's just do an unbiased view of what, what, will, what works best to improve what you're doing that will ultimately is going to save, you know, the best outcomes in any situation and definitely with along those lines is being a, um, a lot more doing more training simulation training doing some things along those lines so that's what i'm doing i'm also doing the online education side doing seminars um, or, or symposiums online i did the uh, my company hosted uh the um, sports emergency care symposium back in april those uh, will do that i'm doing another one again in the fall later in the fall uh, also added some uh, debate type of courses along those lines, web, live webinars. One was um, um, Next Witness, Please, which had a we had a fantastic time doing that and having a, a mock trial online where the, where the yeah. audience could vote. And uh, I guess to choose, they're the jury and uh, with a simulated case and then doing some other things along those lines. And just, uh, you know, having fun uh, doing emergency medicine and doing uh, things in, in business growing. Very cool. Well, Please check the show notes for, for Ray, Ray's website to learn a little bit more about his company. If you need emergency medical services, you can check it out there. Now, last last question. Any other topics that we didn't discuss that you want to share or you feel is important to address? 
Um, no, I think the one thing I, I put in, a, I came up with this one, one quote, especially the, in terms of cardiac events and things is that I just want to share that, that I, I created this slide and I use it now whenever I'm talking about cardiac events is, is, you know, the AED is the perfect athlete, is the perfect teammate. Um, and that, you know, basically on the quote is if you think of Michael Jordan, for example, um, that if you put an athlete, if, but a lot of times the AED is sitting on the sidelines and is never put in play. And if you can't, and they will make the, if you give the ball to the AED, it's going to make the shot every time. It's going to make a shock. It's going to happen every time. And you, if you don't put them in the game, you never know if it's going to happen. So with that being said, get an AED, put it in play, and the good things can happen. Excellent. Thank you, Ray. This has been fantastic. Just a, a wealth of knowledge, a lot of very critical information. So hopefully our listeners can think about this, look at some things, especially if they have risk factors. Be sure to get your cell checked, get your kids checked, especially if they're playing high intense sports. Now, you're not done yet. I have three <laughs> what's called curveball questions for you. They have nothing to do with today's topic. Just fun stuff. Yeah. The first question is um, just one that I ask every single person. I'm a big music fan. I love music. So if you could be the singer in any band, whether they're still together or not, who would that be? Van Halen. Oh, Van Halen. That was quick. You knew instantly. Uh, look, hey, they're my, well, my first concert I ever went to. My brother took me to the Jackson Memorial Coliseum or, and watched uh, de- in like 81. And I was deaf for like three or four years, th- three or four hours later. But at the same time, you know, I just, I, I love Van Halen. So uh, that old Van Halen. So nice. You know, no, um, I, you know, I, I can't kick, I, you know, I can try to do yoga lies, but David Lee Roth, I can't quite get the kicks he does, but you know, I could probably do a squelch pretty loud. But yes, <laughs> David Lee Roth. And then now uh, this this David question Roth. seems to get people sometimes, but what would older Ray today go back to Ray 35 years ago as you're starting your athletic training career and give you advice? Ooh, um, you know, the one thing I saw was really listen to older people. And listen to, my, to, you know, I, when I was younger, I remember this and this happened. I can't believe you asked me this question, but this is really good. So I remember about doing as a younger athlete trainer, I was doing stuff. And about seven years later, I wanted to, I'm like, gosh, dog it. I'm like, I don't, I, you know, he was right or she was right. And I tried <laughs> to do things. I try to run through the wall. You know, you try to don't, there's no need to run through the wall. You know, just no, people have run through the wall. And if you're going to run through a wall, you better know that there's a there's a steel pole behind that wall that are more than likely, and you know where not to run into it. So, you know, those are things like that. Just, you know, it comes from people are trying to do well. They listen, even though you want to try to do your own path, but there's a time and place to do that. And, uh, you know, but just try to, you know, just always ask and, and try not to do it on yourself, by yourself. All right, last question. So this one's kind of new. I don't think I've ever asked this question to anyone, but I was like, I think this is a good question for Ray. If you had to pick your favorite moment of your career as an athletic trainer, and this may be hard, but what would you say your favorite moment was? Is there anything that stands out that says, man, I'm really proud of this? Oh, wow. You know, there is, um, I, I did, it's not something you take a picture over. It's not something that, that, that I have a, Hey, I have on the wall, but it's just being there for those moments when it's just multiple times. It's like these little moments you have where an athlete and they had to re they come back and play or for the most part that a student, um, you know, I had one of my former students or do this there, they, they just accomplish something. And I see them, they, they, they've had to struggle through something and they succeed. And it was them that, they think that, you know, I may have had, a, they, they thank you, but it's really, it's all them. They did it, you know, just, you know, that's, it's hard to explain that. That's a, it's a really tough question. I, I don't, um, you know, I think, I think, I, think I, I get it. I mean, you're like a proud but, parent, right? But, but I would tell you this though, that, that really the, the coolest moment I've had though, I think one of the coolest moments though, was I was working Mississippi Gulf Coast Marathon, this pat and I, and I went up to it near the finish, finish line. Nobody's working the race. And I, I mean, people up there, but this one runner, it's the end of the race, and I happen to be the first one of the first ones just across the finish line. And this athlete had this sense of like, you knew it took her. She, I mean, it was a it was a hard race for her, but she had she stopped and she had this look of like, you know, just you so many emotions at one time. And all I did was go up and give her a high five. 
And it's one of the coolest high fives I've had, I've, I've given. I just, it, I see that and it's just that, that moment of, cause I've, you know, you run something really hard and you accomplish something. You don't know what the story is behind it, but you know, it's for something good. They, they got themselves better or they're running for somebody else. It was just this, that unique moment in time that you can't capture on picture or anything else. So that's, awesome. that's probably the most recent thing, probably. Excellent. Ray, thank you so much for the time today to share your knowledge expertise. My pleasure. It was so much fun, great information, and we look forward to having you again in the near future. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate all the work y'all are doing as well. It's helping to educate, um, you know, athletes and parents and everyone else and in, in, uh, coaches and, and healthcare providers in keeping uh, in uh, helping keep people safety. Safe. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ray. Have a wonderful day. You too. Have a good one. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.